Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for attending the virtual book launch for Red Gold, The Managed Extinction of the Giant Bluefin Tuna by Jennifer Teleska. My name is Heather Skinner, and I am the publicist and assistant marketing manager at the University of Minnesota Press. And when Jennifer's book came out last spring, uh, we could not have imagined how much the COVID-19 pandemic would change the landscape of so many things that we do, uh, including book events. So we are very happy to be finally having this book launch event for the book and for her. Um, the University of Minnesota Press is honored to be Jennifer's publisher. And we can't wait for you to hear our author and wonderful group of discussants here this afternoon. A few housekeeping items to get out of the way before we get started. Uh, this event is being recorded and will be available after the event on the University of Minnesota Press YouTube channel so that you can look at it, listen to it, share it, whatever you would like to do, that would be great. Um, and please consider subscribing to the University of Minnesota Press YouTube channel for more great content. And I will post that link in the chat in just a moment. Uh, if you need closed captioning, you can turn that on at the bottom of your screen. There should be a CC live transcript button at the bottom uh, or top of your screen. If you click on it, then click on enable auto transcription. That should start the closed captioning for you. And we plan to have time for viewer questions. So please post your questions in the Q&A function, um, not the chat, please, the Q&A. And we will either, um, uh, please note that you can upvote questions um that you would like to see answered most and we will do our best to get to as many questions as we can uh, when um, in the course of the program and lastly if you have not already purchased a copy of red gold you can order one from the university of minnesota press website at upress.umn.edu and use the special 40 percent off discount code that will be posted in the chat again momentarily and now to begin um, I'd like to introduce our moderator for the event this afternoon. Macarena gomez Barris is founding director of the Global South Center and chairperson of the Department of Social Science and Cultural Studies at Pratt Institute, Brooklyn. Her most recent book is The Extractive, Extractive Zones, Social Ecologies and Decolonial Perspectives, and she is completing a new book, At the Sea's Edge, Liquidity Beyond the Colonial Anthropocene, both from Duke University Press. I will post a detailed bio for Maka here in the chat momentarily. So welcome and thank you, Maka. Thank you so much, Heather. It's so exciting to be here and to celebrate you, Jennifer Teleska, author of this extraordinary book, Red Gold, The Managed Extinction of the Giant Blue Fin Tuna, and by University of Minnesota Press, who has been so generous and done such a beautiful job, including with its gorgeous cover. We have a terrific lineup today to celebrate this book. And as Heather mentioned, it was published last year in April at a time when we were gonna have a book launch with uh, University of Minnesota Press with the Global South Center at Pratt Institute in Manhattan. Um, and as Jennifer herself can tell you, it's not easy to publish a book during this time, especially one like this that's absorbed the better part of the author's past decade. So I wanna thank the University of Minnesota Press uh, for taking the baton and hosting the book launch this evening. So let me just say a few words and then I'll introduce our panelists um, and our author this evening. Red Gold is a terrific, brave and an important book and it tells the present day story of marine global governance. It does so by tracking the commodification of the giant blue fin tuna and it does so through deep ethnographic practice that I think we can all learn from. It tracks the ruby red meat that um, Jennifer really lovingly describes this charismatic creature that's literally gold on the, gold, uh, the global capitalist market. I found the book to be brilliant when I first read it last summer, and then the second read, I learned even more from it to prepare for this evening. It's a narrated cultural history, but it also has a deep critique of marine extractivism, and it situates the oceanic global governance systems within specific market practices that lead to capital accumulation through the management of extinction. And I hope that Jennifer will hear more directly about that very uh, supple and complex set of terms that you're using there and, and maneuvers actually. 
By focusing on the story of the bluefish tuna, author Jennifer Teleska tells us a much larger narrative, one that is in the direction of more than human post-humanist anthropology, but also speaks to legal studies and many, many other interdisciplinary formations. And what it does is centering how shadow elites organize power through the scale of the supranational scale. Teleska shows us contractual relationships between nation states and how they're made uh, upon the body of the giant bluefin tuna alongside 30 other creatures, as well as what she refers to or as what's referred to as a bycatch and how this becomes the very high stakes currency of the International Commission of the Conservation of Atlantic Tuna, also known as ICCAT. And you'll hear much more directly about ICCAT from Jennifer, from the panelists. Um, but I just wanna say congratulations and thank you, Jennifer, for this important book, this timely work. It's extraordinary. And I think you've been able to discuss the management of extinction and how that itself traverses multiple fields of study to produce this book, which I think pre presents to us uh, stellar research and environmental writing. And of course, I think of in the vein of Rachel Carson. So thank you for this work. So let me first introduce our panelists in the order of their presentations. And then I'll go to Jennifer Teleska, who will give an overview of her wonderful book. So Ashley Dawson's professor of post-colonial studies in the English department at the Graduate Center City University of New York and the College of Staten Island. He has many books. Ashley, it's wonderful to be in conversation with you again. And his books include People's Power, Reclaiming the Energy Commons, 2020, Extreme Cities, The Peril and Promise of Urban Life in the Age of Climate Change, 2017 and books on extinction like A Radical History 2016. And also I wanna mention uh, this, the longer bio can also go in the chat as with the other panelists, but Ashley's work in Climate Action Lab is really, really important climate justice activism in New York and far beyond. So thank you so much, Ashley, for being with us today. Eben Kirksey is our next speaker an American anthropologist who specializes on science and justice, was at the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton and we got to cross paths with him uh, and at Pratt um, uh, a couple years ago. So that was wonderful. The Institute for Advanced Study hosted Kirksby uh, during the 2019-2020 year academic year. And you might have not seen it yet, but I highly recommend this latest book, The Mutant Project, Inside the Global Race to Genetically Modify Humans by St. Martin's Press, an important work that's in a kind of public and intellectual arena like all of our other panelists and like the voice that's so present in Jennifer's book, this kind of you know, work that's in a public intellectual realm. So congratulations on that book, Eben, also author of Emergent Ecologies and other work, currently associate professor at Deakin University in Melbourne, Australia. So welcome Eben to this panel, lovely to have you. And then we also have Nayanika Matur, an associate professor in anthropology in South Asian studies at the University of Oxford. It's an honor to be, to have you here on the panel as well. Also currently a fellow of Wolfson College. She is author of the award-winning book, Paper Tiger, Law, Bureaucracy, and the Developmental State in Himalayan India. So thank you for your uh, expertise that you bring in relationship to questions of law as well in the state that I think are so central also to Jennifer's book. New work that's forthcoming with the University of Chicago Press is entitled Crooked Cats. I love this title, Crooked Cats, Beastly Encounters in the Anthropocene. And this really deals with the question of big cats that make prey of humans in India in light of the climate crisis that has been a really important kind of ongoing theme as well. So thank you all and thank you Nayanika as well for being here. And we'll go in that order after we hear from our author, uh, scholar and author, Jennifer Teleska who is currently an assistant professor of environmental justice in the Department of Social Science and Cultural Studies at the Pratt Institute. Red Gold, the managed extinction of the giant blue fish, uh, fin tuna, 
out by University of Minnesota Press, as I just mentioned, is her first book, but we expect many more from you, um, Jennifer. Um, and even though we know that it's taken um, years of your life, so thank you for your dedication. I also wanna highlight the fact that Jennifer has written uh, op-eds about the cultural economy of ocean governance for Hakai Magazine and Yale, um, e60.org, and also been involved in some important interviews and conversations in Earth Island Journal and Psychology Today. The work is on ocean studies and it spans a human animal relationship. And I wanna say that I've seen in person the dedication that Jennifer has to making change with students, with educators on campus, on and off campus in global governance institutions. So thank you for all of that work and what you model for us. And I'll turn over the word to you now, Jennifer. Again, congratulations for this wonderful book launch and this uh, amazing set of um, conversations. Thank you, Maka. Uh, thank you all, uh, my panelists for, for joining. And um, I want to share with you all some pictures, uh, including some pictures from the field and including some pictures from the bluefin. So um, uh, let me uh, say up to all who are joining. So it's good afternoon, good evening, good morning um, to all who have tuned in. We span time zones now. Um, and I am beyond uh, relieved, thrilled, ecstatic at this point um, to finally express publicly my deep thanks to family, to colleagues, to friends who have seen this book through um, with me to completion. As Malka mentioned, Red Gold is the product of 10 years of research and writing. In these years, I've accumulated many debts to many people, too many to name here. Even so, I wanna give special thanks to our panelists, Ashley, Eben, uh, Malka, and Nyanika, and to the sponsors of today's event at Pratt Institute, the Department of Social Science and Cultural Studies, the School of Liberal Arts and Sciences, the Global South Center, the Sustainability Coalition, the last, the lead organizer of Pratt's Earth Action Week of which this event is part. Not least, I am forever indebted to our host, the University of Minnesota Press for believing early on in the durability of red gold. It's fitting for me as a professor at Pratt an art and design university to express my enthusiasm for the cover. It's a detail of a painting by Stanley Meltzoff, a Brooklyn born artist known as one of the first to represent big game sport fish in their natural environment. Coincidentally, Meltzoff taught painting at Pratt once home from soldiering as an army illustrator in World War II. He could not possibly have known then his work would speak to the argument of the book writ small, captured here in image. Unlike typical depictions that reduce the animal to machine, to commodity, to predator, to prey, here the bluefin underwater looks the viewer in the eye. We, the audience, must confront the bluefin being. It's an invitation to take marginalized life seriously, doubly so at a time of mass extinction. Seen here, the bluefin schools with mates who in the background fade away like phantoms. Although in reality, the bluefin may not enjoy the yellow stripe across her nose, we might imagine that Meltzoff anticipated the bluefin's worth as gold. After all, the yellow stripe only appears as a reflection coming from us as viewers who project our prior assumptions onto the fish and the greatest assumption dominant in society projected onto the bluefin today is that she's just another good for sale as if passively awaiting consumption by global elites in the sushi economy. In 10 years, I've learned that most people I encounter know two things about the bluefin, if anything at all. One, they're endangered, and two, they're worth a lot of money. Indeed, one bluefin from the Pacific sold for a record US dollars, 3.1 million at Tokyo Tsukiji Marketplace in January, 2019. The ruby colored flesh of the bluefin is the most expensive sushi money can buy, hence red gold. Contrast these popular understandings 
to another image of the bluefin, the one I want to know, cultivate, and honor. When I was a kid walking the docks off Shinnecock and Montauk Inlets off Eastern Long Island, not far from New York City, fishers in there every day called the bluefin giant. And giant she was. In this record catch from 1979 off Nova Scotia in Canada, a bluefin the size of a horse weighed a whopping 1,500 pounds. She's double the size of a hefty adult male. 1496 is etched onto her body, hanging from a noose like a lynching. Today, you'll never see the bluefin this big. She's no longer left in the sea to grow. That's how profitable she has become. The loss of this ocean giant is a signal of precarious futures if they remain tethered to a predatory regime of value. The bluefin is an extraordinary creature, like all creatures are, if only people took the time to get to know them. Who knows the bluefin is warm-blooded, somewhere on the evolutionary scale between a cold-blooded cod and a mammalian blue whale. The capacity to elevate her internal temperature higher than surrounding water is what makes her meat red, not white like albacore or skipjack found in cans. Cheetah-like, with an exceptionally large heart, the bluefin is matched in speed only by the sailfish. The bluefin can cross the entire Atlantic Ocean in 40 days and somehow find the nine mile stretch of the Strait of Gibraltar to enter the Mediterranean Sea. She traverses the entire ocean, exploding up and down the water column, encountering waters black and icy cold where people have never been. She used to habit the South Atlantic off Brazil, but her kin were so fished out in the 1960s that there's no longer a bluefin fishery there, wiped out. Enter the International Commission for the Conservation of Atlantic Tunas, ICAT, which formed by treaty in 1969 under the mandate to conserve marine life on the high seas. Consider that when ICAT formed more than a half century ago, maritime nations already knew that the ocean was emptying of wild fish. ICAT is entrusted by the authority delegated to it by the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea to care for creatures crossing national jurisdictions over the vast expanse of the Atlantic Ocean and its nearby seas, including the Mediterranean. ICAT is one of dozens of regional fisheries bodies that regulate the supply of fish in international waters. ICAT is the most important of them by virtue of its membership alone. Over half the world's countries participate as ICAT member states, including countries well beyond the Atlantic Basin, China, Japan, Vanuatu, name three. The bluefin is not the only animal that has declined in size and number under ICAT stewardship. Swordfish, marlin, shark, tuna, such as big eye and uh, yellowfin, seabird, turtle, and other creatures caught as bycatch are now all stressed. Note that ICAT does not issue rules whatsoever for a dozen small tunas, bonito, mackerel, wahoo, caught by artisanal fishers in say Ghana, Senegal, Cameroon. Small tunas are considered commercially insignificant, that is not trafficked on the global market, even though they accounted for 28% of the total reported catch in the Atlantic Basin from 1980 to 2010. That the poor concentrating in black and brown communities the world over were not served very well by the ICAT apparatus should not be lost on the audience. Indeed, colonial histories matter as chapters one and two make clear. The ICAT secretariat is based in the landlocked capital of Madrid, the result of lobbying by the Generalissimo Francisco Franco pictured here, the avid sport fisher from Galicia. With his fascist bravado, Franco reimagined La Patria by evoking the memory of the Spanish Armada. The sea we learn throughout the book is a site where global empires play out often through the fish trade. The question animating the book thus, what has ICAT been doing if not its advertised purpose to serve sea creatures uh, under threat. To find out, I went inside the belly of the beast. I applied for observer status and got in. I spent three years attending ICAT meetings and another two conducting follow-up interviews on site. 
I found that ICAD conserves the bluefin not for her indispensable place in ocean ecologies or to ensure an ocean full of fish for future generations. Conserved instead are the export markets of the signatories to the ICAT treaty. I learned that ICAT member states have become speculators in the market. That is, they were attuned to exploiting the risk associated with financing the trade of underlying assets in the sushi economy. The institution by design has become not a protector of sea life, but a warden of economies of inventories to such an extent that ICAT has become a structural feature of what I call commodity empires. Said a high ranking ICAT delegate to me at the Paris Commission meeting in 2010, you take our fish, we don't give you bananas or coffee. To put it bluntly, the bluefin has become the most valuable fish stock in ICAT's portfolio. The loss of an estimated 90% of big fish across the planet is not the result of inept fumbling bureaucracies. In fact, the world's most powerful fisheries management organization, ICAT, shows that delegates organized with remarkable efficiency the profitable extermination of a former ocean giant in just a few decades. Experts did the job asked of them under international law in place since the 1950s to secure a maximum supply of food and other marine products in the first place for human consumption. Call it speciesism or the commitment to human superiority as if a hierarchy of value amongst beings is the natural order of things. Red gold shows that the inability or unwillingness to respect our fellow beings lies at the heart of our ecological crises. To think a world as vast and varied as the ocean can and should be mastered and exploited slowly, solely to elite advantage by commodifying fish must stop. Let me be clear, it is easy to blame greedy fishers or sleepy bureaucrats for drinking the Kool-Aid of dubious specialized frameworks like ecosystem services and maximum sustainable yield. The problem is much more complex than that. Under the prevailing conditions of valuation, the very institution entrusted to conserve high seas fish must be seen as an agent of extinction. ICAT and its constellation of like institutions in ocean governance have not only overseen the slaughter, they have provoked it and they will continue to do so unless, unless the dominant culture under extractive capitalism no longer consents to the carnage no longer remains alienated and ill-informed about the way people get their food and what incredible creatures fish are. To find an affinity between the marginalization of non-human animals and the marginalization of people based on race, sex, sexuality, religion, and the like is not meant to say suffering is equal or can be substituted as if a zero sum game. The point is to show that this marginalization is part of the same system wherein the status of populations is a constant negotiation among experts preoccupied with the biological in the exercise of power. This system must change. Regulatory regimes under the thumb of finance capital have become central to, must become central to our discussions of mass extinction, the sixth in the planet's four and a half billion year history this one caused by global elites extracting wealth and status from non-human natures reduced to their commodity form. So where do we go from managed extinction? We must hold accountable not only the capitalists profiteering from extraction, at a certain extent this is easy, but we also must hold accountable their enablers, the technocrats, the scientists, even the environmentalists. Diplomats, policymakers, lawyers, scientists must reimagine their mission beyond their individual career and national self-interest. People must see themselves not only as consumers with purchasing power, but as citizens who make demands on their government to care for our common home. Worldviews that restore the sanctity of life must take center stage in lawmaking. In closing, I'd like to gesture to some of the challenges of writing red gold. I know what I know mostly through participant observation. Ethnography was multi-sided in space and compressed in time. 
to track the ICAT network across three continents. Chapters four and five try to bridge multi-sided, multi-species ethnography in a zone less trafficked by scholars interested in the human-animal interface, that is, in international relations. But diplomatic zones are notoriously difficult to access, which explains why ethnographies of them are so few. Of the 38 interviews I conducted, only four were completely on the record. My interlocutors were understandably tight-lipped in their official capacities. Before turning the mic over, I'd like to end by encouraging a disposition that moves us away from narratives suggesting that the goal should be to save the bluefin from extermination, like parallel discourses of saving the rainforest, the tiger, the spotted owl. This point I develop in chapter three, where I discuss what I call the savior plot. This narrative is reproduced widely, including in the Netflix documentary, Seaspiracy, now making the rounds. The savior plot reproduced in such venues as the New York Times goes like this. Bourgeois readers come to know a villain preying on innocent victims in nature. Environmentalists or journalists appear as the heroes who could save them from the existential horror of annihilation. Familiar in its missionary zeal, Judeo-Christian in its roots, the savior plot assures the public that the serpent could be expelled from the Garden of Eden and the bluefin rescued from the dark forces brought to light by liberal saviors. But the bluefin is not a thing to be saved, like money compounding interest in a bank account. She's a being to be honored and respected. Reverence and empathy for our more than human worlds are a precondition for beings ever to be saved. I hope this more related approach, based not on material culture, but on mutual care, allows for a sense of intimacy in our encounters with non-human worlds and introduces concerns about environmental justice. As I mourn the loss of the ocean I knew as a child, I want to move through the anxiety wrought by ecological destruction and encourage the audience to reclaim our common home where we live, work, and play with beings from our more than human worlds. So with that, um, I'll stop the screen share and I'll pass the um, baton on to uh, Ashley. Thank you so much, Jennifer. Um, it's uh, an honor and uh, a great privilege to be part of this fantastic panel. Um, I'm really looking forward to being in dialogue with all the other panelists. Um, I also want to thank Maka for uh, that brilliant introduction, very generous introduction. Um, so I have some comments prepared. Uh, I'll go through them. In the summer of 2017, members of the volunteer-run entomological society Krefeld in Germany published a paper that shocked both scientists and the general public. The work of the citizen scientists documented a nearly 80% decline in the number of insects caught over the course of several decades in special traps located in local nature reserves. The speed and scale of the insect population crash stunned even professional entomologists who had been studying the problem in depth. Members of the Entomological Society Krefeld worked with scientists in the Netherlands on a trend analysis of the data they'd gathered over the years. The final study, which looked at more than 63 nature preserves, found consistent declines across every habitat studied. The authors wrote that this suggested, quote, that it is not only the vulnerable species, but the flying insect community as a whole that has been decimated over the last few decades. News of this dramatic die off of insects in what should have been a relatively stress-free environment rocketed around the world, generating headlines about an insect ap apocalypse. The shocking news indicated that something absolutely fundamental had gone wrong in the relationship of people to the natural world in the world's wealthy nations. Responding to a subsequent study of insect populations in Britain that confirmed the stark data from Creffold, Gary Mantle of the UK-based Wildlife Trust argued that, quote, this unnoticed apocalypse should set alarm bells ringing. We have put at risk some of the fundamental building blocks of life. But 
what if we know that the world's precious species are endangered and still do nothing to stop their annihilation? The setup of the Creffold study was that no one realized that insects were as endangered as they were. This question of uh, what we do if we don't stop the annihilation while still knowing it is at the heart of Jennifer Teleska's book, Red Gold. Jennifer's book is an expose, as you've heard, of the majestic bluefin tuna's near total extermination over the last five decades. It's an event that ranks high in the annals of today's sixth extinction, one that, to make matters worse, has been carried out under the regulatory eye of an international conservation organization, um, ICAT, the International Commission for the Conservation of Atlantic Tuna. Jennifer's scholarly work packs a gut-wrenching wallop that is as powerful and urgent as Rachel Carson's Silent Spring. I agree with Maka on this, this uh, account. Um, of course, Carson's work helped to spark the environmental movement in the US, and uh, we can only hope that Jennifer's work has a similar kind of impact. It's certainly written in incredibly vivid and limpid, limpid prose, and it documents an utterly horrible decimation of Atlantic tuna. Um, You've already gotten a bit of a sense of the many different interventions that Red Gold makes. I'm gonna to touch on three central ones that I find particularly um, interesting and valuable. First of all, Red Gold explains the manner in which the techno-scientific institutions charged with conserving the bluefin tuna became central to their extermination. The effective extinction of the bluefin tuna is part of a larger unspeakable tragedy whereby non-human species and many human beings as well were rendered utterly alien by the epistemological mechanisms of Western imperial science, only to be measured, quantified, and exploited beyond the point of no return. As Jennifer shows, organizations like ICAT actually perform the job asked of them since their political mandate is not to protect tuna and other fish, but rather to protect the export markets of the countries that sign their trade agreements. Red Gold challenges the cant employed by major multinational institutions like ICAT to obfuscate their role in destroying life on this planet. As Jennifer shows in Red Gold, there has been nearly universal quiescence and even tacit affirmation of the institutions and practices that have managed the virtual extinction of the bluefin tuna. This isn't an accident. To speak out against these institutions is to put lucrative consulting contracts and even one's entire career as a researcher in jeopardy. Jennifer calls out these powerful actors in her academic writing and in her public facing journalism, an act that I think is incredibly courageous and valuable. And one we're all here to celebrate today. Red Gold's second key intervention is to challenge dominant media narratives concerning the putative ineptitude of ICAT and similar, similar regulatory bodies. ICAT delegates are not bumbling bureaucrats, but rather skilled administrators of the program with which they are tasked to exploit bluefin tuna as an economic resource, quote unquote, to the greatest extent possible. In order to explain this history of destruction, Jennifer develops the concept of a predatory regime of value that underpins ICAT's work and the practices of regional fishery management organizations. Sustainability was defined, she argues, not around efforts to preserve bluefin tuna populations, but rather around the project of ceaseless economic growth of ICAT member states. In theorizing the destructive regime of value embraced by official conservation organizations like ICAT, Jennifer adds to the work of pathbreaking theorists of world ecology and eco-socialism, such as Jason Moore and John Bellamy Foster, who highlight the exterminatory drive of an economic system predicated on ceaseless expansion within a finite planetary resource base. And lastly, Red Gold argues that in order to carry out the exterminatory program that I have mentioned, um, ICAT delegates had to adopt an objectifying view towards bluefin tuna, to see them as a commodified product rather than as the elder gods that writers such as Hemingway thought they embodied. Jennifer's analysis of how this cultural shift in attitudes towards the tuna takes place adds to the work done by critics such as uh, Carolyn Merchant, an ecofeminist whose seminal death of nature traces the way in which European science developed through the atomization and dissection of nature. 
for Jennifer, the objectification and commodification of the natural world paves the way for utter alienation of people from other sentient beings on this planet. And her sort of evocative plea to think differently, um, you've, you've just heard. Extinction is incomprehensible without understanding this system, systematic alienation. While other critics have tracked the unfolding of this objectifying logic in modern conservation regimes, Jen's work, Jennifer's work on the oceans brings to light a realm that remains all too invisible to most people and to much critical thought as well. Her book should thus be seen as a pioneering instance of what is coming to be known as the blue humanities or ocean studies. One of the things that catalyzed my own work on extinction was the impression circulating in much public discourse that human beings in general are responsible for the biodiversity crisis. Reading dominant news coverage of the biodiversity crisis, as well as many scientific reports, one gets the impression that human beings are like a plague of locusts descending on pristine natural environments, stripping them bare and then moving on, leaving nothing but barren earth in our wake. It can consequently seem that there is something intrinsic to the human condition, perhaps as a result of our long evolutionary history as a species that drives us to exploit the natural world in a completely unhinged manner. This analysis needs to be challenged since it, was likely, it is likely to produce political paralysis. After all, <clears throat> if human beings are inherently and immutably bent on plundering nature, why bother to fight against ecocide? And Jennifer's book, clearly adds to this project of challenging a kind of ahistorical and ultimately extremely racist uh, attitude. It is not humanity in general that is responsible for the crash of biodiversity. Many indigenous people, forest dwelling peoples, peasants and fisher folk around the world have existed for millennia in a remarkably balanced, even symbiotic relationship with the natural world. In addition, Historical analysis shows that extinction rates only really ticked up significantly during the period of European colonial expansion after the 15th century. Uh, and of course then exploded during the so-called great acceleration after 1945, the period uh, during which ICAT was established and oversaw the decimation of um, bluefin tuna. In other words, the biodiversity crash is a product of the intertwined forces of colonialism and capitalism. The brutal contradictions of a capitalist system based on ceaseless, feckless expansion on a finite natural resource base are apparent in the woods, the streams, the fields, and the oceans as the planet and its precious multitudinous life forms endure this ex extinction. If it is the polluting behavior of a handful of powerful corporations and the unsustainable consumption patterns of wealthy people in specific parts of the world that are mainly to blame for the biodiversity crisis, then of course we may hope to stem and even reverse ecocide by calling out and shutting down such unsustainable practices. Yet while I do believe that environmental activists must embrace an anti-capitalist politics, I certainly do not intend to imply that we must wait for the overthrow of capitalism to challenge ecocide. But where to start? The dominant response to ecological problems in nations like the US tends to be to shift blame to individual consumption choices, suggesting that if we all only ate less tuna or beef or flew less, everything would be all right. Jennifer's work shows how ridiculous this approach is by tracing the political economy of global fisheries regulation that has developed alongside the decimation of bluefin tuna populations. So would tighter regulation save the bluefin? As Jennifer notes, major marine advocates like Greenpeace and the World Wildlife Fund have long pressured international agencies like ICAT to manage the bluefin better. The ongoing decline of the bluefin and the complicity of ICAT in their fate suggests that this pressure has been totally inadequate. Does this mean pressure should be intensified or should environmental activists be calling for the abolition of ICAT and similar regional fisheries management organizations? If so, what should replace such organizations after their abolition? How can we reverse the apparent tragedy of the oceanic commons that ICAT has overseen? Could new models of management that exclude big industrial fishing fleets and instead give fishing rights exclusively to local artisanal fishing cooperatives help to stem the slaughter of sea creatures? Such arrangements were put in place in the coastal waters of Chile after the fall of the Pinochet regime, leading to a remarkable regime, uh, regeneration of marine ecosystems that has attracted some uh, scholarly attention. 
But would such commoning arrangements be feasible for a species such as the bluefin tuna, which traverses the high seas through zones that no nation controls directly? Lastly, if we are to break up the unsustainable global food systems of today, how do we ensure that the world's most vulnerable people and places do not suffer disproportionately during the transition to a new, more sustainable arrangement? I think it's really timely that we're having this panel right now. The last year has hammered home the immediacy of the biodiversity crisis. As researchers like Rob Wallace and Mike Davis have shown, COVID-19 emerged from global capitalism's relentless drive towards expansion, a drive that leads to deforestation and other forms of extraction that are not just destroying fragile natural environments around the world, but also exposing humanity to an increasing number of new and deadly pathogens. The pandemic has made it abundantly clear that the biodiversity crisis should be of grave concern even to those who seldom think about endangered populations of flora and fauna. Of course, this point is seldom made by racists like former President Donald Trump, who would rather blame the pandemic on Asian people than on the economic system that so handsomely rewards him. And of course, Donald Trump is just part of a rising tide of eco-fascist sort of nativist arguments. This means that activists and movements must fight hard to make sure the public understands the root causes as well as the solutions, genuine solutions to the biodiversity crisis. Unfortunately, as grim as the last year has been, COVID-19 is a foretaste of worse catastrophes to come if the world continues on its present course towards biodiversity and climate crisis. The science is clear. We're barreling towards global suicide and taking most of the planet's precious ecosystems done with us. But as Jennifer's work shows, it is the rich and powerful who are most responsible for our collective crisis. And it's the world's most vulnerable who will suffer, and indeed in many cases are already suffering first and most gravely. An escape from this catastrophic trajectory towards extinction will only come if the global majority rises up against the avaricious few who are benefiting for the time being from this increasingly deadly state of affairs. Thanks so much. I'll stop there and I'll turn things over to the next speaker who I believe is Evan. Thanks so much for having me. Uh, it's a privilege to be here. Red Gold is an, um, an important book from someone who's seen the marine environment degrade catastrophically uh, before her eyes during her lifetime. The book moves beyond a preoccupation with actuarial accounting methods and shows you know, how those methods are utterly inadequate to render visible the life and death of giant bluefin tuna in vivid language. So Jennifer showed us some pictures of, of the meeting rooms, these, these sterile spaces where people have flags and you know their little doilies for their their cups and you know even as she's doing work in this environment she's able to do the work of multi-species eth ethnography or what we might call speculative ethology sort of re reaching out past um, uh, you know the limits of, of the, the horizons that are in these rooms to, to do the the thick description of the life and the death of the bluefin tuna. She clocks over 50 miles per hour. She tears through salted water like a bullet, accelerating as if her heart were a Porsche engine, one of the fastest fish at sea, cheetah-like. She is a fetish, a memory, an ambition, a mystery, a career, a vocation, a rush. She is also a beating muscle, a world traveler, an agenda setter, an elusive data point, a legend among anglers, a status-bearing token, and fatally, a piece of red gold. She's writing against the backdrop of warming ocean temperatures, ocean acidification, floating microplastics, the accumulation of toxins such as mercury. This book describes the limits of a predatory regime of value that by treaty continues to regulate the capture of living beings as biological assets. Again, as Ashley pointed out, this bureaucracy ICAT is not inept. It's tasked with managing this international fishing industry. And the goal is clear, to fish as hard as possible so that national economies can grow. The scientific institutions entrusted to conserve the bluefin have become central to her extinction. They're moving at a glacial pace in the face of rapid biodiversity loss. The book also accounts for how mainstream environmentalism in the global north is blind to its own complicity in this ongoing disaster. 
it refuses a techno fix as the establishment places all bets on these dream worlds of progress the point the book points to failings in these prevailing dreams and schemes she she contends technocrats cannot regulate a way out of mass extinction that they have helped create there is no wonder drug there is no magic bullet equipped to forestall the ruinous change this planet has rapidly endured she describes violent rifts of a savage political economy that are spreading across the globe to produce marginalized disposable beings of all kinds humans and non-humans collective action is needed so, so this is a very important book that does that descriptive work to show how power is functioning predictably even as it points to possible ruptures possible thunderclaps that we might lean into and and sort of disrupt and expose these these dominant functionings of biopolitical regimes and schemes in short it's it's one of the most important multi-species ethnographies of our day it takes us to a world that um little little is um known about at least in in you know popular consciousness so I, i'm just going to leave it at that uh, simply celebrate this remarkable achievement and um you know uh, again congratulations this is a brilliant intervention i'm so glad to have this book i guess it's me next um thank you so much for having me as part of uh, the celebration Jen, uh, I've been following your work for a while now, and it's a particular privilege to be part of today's discussion. I'm going to be brief, and like Ashley, I'm going to divide, divide up my comments on the three most important interventions I consider Red Gold to be making. Um, and of course, this, you know, this book is so rich in so many ways, and it isn't restricted to these three aspects. But for the sake of brevity, um, I'm going to just focus on three uh, major arguments that sort of, for me, are particularly striking. Firstly, there's the question of ocean governance. Now, of course, Jennifer had exceptional access to the going on, goings on of ICAT and has used ethnographic material brilliantly to firstly challenge the belief in technocratic fixes to the issues of mass extinction, and secondly, to show the power of law and bureaucratic organizations at a supranational level. We get fascinating insights into the inner workings of ICAD, as well as the making of knowledge practices. So Jennifer touches upon how her own knowledge practices were brought into question by scientists, as well as how science itself is deeply political. And you know, again, in this current moment, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has been brought up by a few speakers before that. Um, what is becoming very clear is the need to question knowledge making of all sorts, as well as the complex relationship between science and politics. And in that sense, a red gold sort of took a lead in shining a new light on these increasingly complicated entanglements. Secondly, Jennifer develops the concepts of exterminatory regimes of value, as well as commodity empires in the specific context of fish and demonstrates how these processes of value making and commodification are inherent to ICAT. Her argument that it is this value making which is underpinned by the actions of the bureaucratic body and legal apparatus that ostensibly aims to justly govern the very non-human animals that it, that it is in fact exploiting mercilessly uh, you know, which lies at the core of looming extinction is a vitally important one. And again, I think this, this argument on how value is made and, you know, her, her concept of uh, predatory exterminatory regimes of value is something that we've discussed previously, um, and I'd like to sort of underline that here. Thirdly, Jennifer argues that ICAT is widely represented as an inept and failed uh, organization. Again, the point on bumbling bureaucrats that has come up before, um, yet she argues that ICAT is actually doing its job, which is of commodifying the fish and dividing up an, ex an extended global market for it, actually really very well. It is this efficiency of ICAT that in fact is obscured by the media portrayals of its functioning and ends up discounting the ways in which law works, so law is process, to deplete the population of fishes. Through very careful reading of secondary literature, as well as very, very deep ethnographic engagement, we see quite clearly how law and its indeterminacy, indeterminacy ultimately fueled and regularized investment in what is called red gold. The point that ICAT is considered a failure, but as ethnographically demonstrated, it in fact is very successful in extracting and enforcing an, ex an exterminatory regime of value is one that you know I think we really need to know more about uh, with the details that Jen has sort of provided here. 
So red gold makes one see more clearly that science and technology are not good or bad per se, but it depends on the context. So life-saving medicine versus the destruction of the environment, et cetera, that you know, um, she sort of deals with in the book. So-called science was doing nothing more than deepening the market for red gold. What I found striking and quite disturbing in chapters four and five was how science and technocracy come together to further diminish the chances of saving the fish. And again, Jen in her own talk has talked about this sort of savior plot uh, quite sort of beautifully. Um, and you know, in the book, you see that this project of saving the fish is one that is perhaps not even any more possible. Um, and so overall, this important book of our times really shows how profoundly ICAT has failed in any conservationist measure. It shows how institutions set up to govern non-human animals are actually central to the extermination. And in locating much of this in regimes of value and commodity empires, this book does the valuable work of linking capitalist values and moral codes to the politics of international organizations, legal infrastructure, and competing nation states. So thank you so much, Jennifer, for writing this beautiful, powerful, and moving book. Um, and you know, congratulations again on its publication. What well, fantastic comments. Thank you all for those. I want to give you, Jennifer, the opportunity to um, address any of the comments that came up, the rich engagement with your work, before we turn to many, many, many questions that are open um, and live there in the chat. And I, I had my own questions, but I want to give the opportunity because there's a lot of audience engagement. So first to you, Jennifer, if you wanted to say anything following listening to those comments. Thanks, Maka. Um, I think I'll just take, uh, I'd rather actually get to the uh, the Q&A, but I'll just uh, briefly comment um, and say to each one, uh, so Nyanika, Ashley, Evan, um, right on. It's a, it's an absolute joy when people get your work because um, they don't always. So um, I really appreciate uh, the comments that you've each offered. Um, and also just to share, um, I particularly appreciate Ashley uh, identifying that it's not just the broad category human. Um, I feel like I speak about this a lot in the classroom um, with my students, which is to better be to locate um, that it's actually quite a narrow slice of the global population, i.e. Um, the rich and privileged in many ways who have created the conditions for this to even happen in the first place. Um, Evan, uh, thank you also for mentioning, really, it's how power functions, right? And, um, and as you were offering your comments, I was reminded of how sometimes I typically describe what it's like to be uh, at an ICAT meeting. And more recently, I've done some field work at UN headquarters here in New York. And I think the best way to describe it is it's kind of like a WikiLeaks cable. Right? It's that sense of when the WikiLeaks cables came out, everyone was kind of like, oh yeah, right. That's exactly what it's like. But at the same time, it's that feeling of when you read the WikiLeaks cable for the first time, you realize, yeah, that's what it's really like. Um, and that in many ways, it's kind of what my experience has been inside these um, regulatory regimes. And I wanna say too, um, Thank you, Nyanika, for mentioning the laws process piece. Um, and in many ways, uh, just thinking of my own preoccupations with trying to understand what's the role and function of law. Um, is law merely an instrument of social change? Um, and how, it, how might we imagine law in a way that could um, be better attuned to a value system that moves us away from that predatory, exterminatory um, system that so dominates uh, the world in which we live. Um, so I think really, I, you know, I'd be happy to have, um, to hear questions or um, however you wanna work it, Maka. You, you're muted. Thank you for those comments, uh, Jen and Jennifer, and also for the, panelists uh, comments and it reminds me a little of Ashley's comments the kind of urgency of need to respond with com complex tools in this moment and you know is the law 
a, a, is it too blunt a tool really to address the complexity of these issues? And I think your book shows it is in the ways in which power is imbued and inequality is imbued precisely in these instruments of power. So a lot of questions, a lot of comments. We start with Peter Jacques, who has a couple of different interventions. The first is to ask you about the ethnography itself. And if you can describe that, if the tuna has a kind of life beyond commodification, and then goes on later to say that Peter appreciates the counterpoint of reverence and protection and a non-sustainable and unethical commodification. Uh, Peter says, I think commodification is a pathway to annihilation across history. Do you want to comment on that? Sure. I mean, I think um, I'll share, actually, there was a point, I, I mentioned it in a short ethnographic vignette in the beginning of chapter two, which was there was this moment when I was in uh, Silver Spring, Maryland. So I was attending the meetings of the uh, U.S. Advisory Committee to ICAT meets twice a year in the fall and spring in order to uh, advise the delegates that uh, the U.S. sends to ICAT uh, every year. And there was this moment, you know, you can sort of see there's, you know, there's a typical, you know, there's a ritualized performance in some ways of what it's like to be at these meetings. And part of the ritual is the presentation of the new science. And uh, the scientists, the lead scientists from NOAA, the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Commission, um, which is part of actually the uh, US Department of Commerce, um, gave a presentation. And there was this moment where he offered the results of four tagging. Uh, so, so there's this way in which fishers will go out or scientists will go out with fishers and they'll tag a bluefin uh, in order to find out its migratory patterns, where it swims, how deep it swim, how, how deep the bluefin swims and so on. And so this moment when the, um, the scientists put up on screen uh, the results of these uh, tagging, um, uh, the results of the tags, and it was like the only moment in my entire three years that people in the room stopped and were like, oh, right. this is an extraordinary animal. And so, you know, there's this sense too, um, you know, and, 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 and in many ways, I think this is, you know, really important because you can sort of see, because at the last thing in many ways, I would want people to walk away with is thinking that somehow the people who, it, who participate in ICAT are like the great evildoers. You know, they're not, they're, they're doing their jobs in some ways. And, um, and many of them are deeply convicted, conflicted about the work that they do. Um, and it was really well uh, illustrated to me in that one moment when people knew that we had on our hands an extraordinary animal and yet the bluefin um, had to revert back to her commodity form in order to carry on the work of ICAT. Yeah, in this next question, thank you for that, um, is from an anonymous attendee and talks about the fish being endangered. So why is it still being overfished? There's still a kind of uh, in incredulous um, kind of reaction here. Why is the fish, uh, why, is, why is it still the bluefin tuna being overfished if it's endangered? So a question just directly about that. I mean, I think the best way to understand that is the way in which the, the bluefin is not a panda, right? So there's no global market for pandas like there are for bluefin, right? In the sense that, um, and so as a result, there was a moment um, both in the early 90s uh, and then in 2010 where there was an effort to list the bluefin formally as an endangered creature under um, the CITES Treaty, which is um, the treaty in place that's formally available um, to protect a creature um, if nation states agree that this animal is uh, worthy of protection. And so in some ways, um, you can see the way in which the legal system itself is already caught up in larger uh, 
pressures of economy um, because the legal system can't adequately respond to protecting the animal because the bluefin is so um, central uh, to the sushi economy. Mm. Um, and so, um, you know, so in some ways, uh, the legal system isn't really the, the appropriate route um, to, uh, or at least from the perspective of insiders to be able to adequately um, protect this creature. Um, and, you know, I, in, in some ways, um, you know, I, I think it's, it's really important to recognize that it's not to say that the bluefin, you know, is extinct, right? So here we are, here I am in New York and on all likelihood this summer, if I um, went, uh, you know, offshore, um, I'd certainly catch a bluefin, but the difference here, um, and this is the critical point, and especially if we remember that image that I showed during the, um, during the slide is that part of what's going on is it's not just the depletion of the number of, of bluefin, it's the decrease in her size. Um, and this really matters because, so fish are not people, right? So the older and more mature uh, fishes, the more that fish contributes to future generations. And so when you take the big fish out of the ocean, effectively what you're doing is you're robbing future generations of that, um, of that stable group of, um, group of animals. So, um, and I, I think that's a, a really important distinction because oftentimes the loss of the size of the animal tends to get papered over um, as people become preoccupied with just the inventory, the number of fish. Thank you for that, Jen. Uh, I appreciate that. And, you know, this speaks to a couple of different questions. I think Ashley raised this as well. And then there's some chat in the Q&A, but also a comment in uh, the chat section about regeneration and the efforts to regenerate. And certainly, you know, Eben's written on bioengineering and this kind of question that's come up in Elizabeth Colbert's recent work about the kind of future of bioengineering uh, our natural world and um, or post-natural as it were. So I'm wondering if you can address that. I mean, you started to, to talk about that in your last answer, but this I think touches on a, a couple of different questions and comments. So, um, you know, I admittedly didn't see the, the question. Can you, uh, I didn't see the question in the, in the chat, the regenerate. Yeah, are there any regenerative efforts happening here? Uh, often we hear more about regenerative agriculture and what are the other kinds of stories to transition? You know, what about the blue fish essentially? Well, you know, so the great regenerative story told from industry is fish farming. Right, so, um, right, and this is a huge problem, right? So, um, and this is, it's, it's really, uh, you know, this part, you know, so people assume that, oh, you know, so if wild fish are gone, then we'll just start farming them. And, uh, and so this is treated as one of those silver, silver bullets, and this clearly is not um, in large part. So when you have our carnivorous fish, so a fish that eats other fish means that you have to go out into the ocean in order to catch more fish to feed the animal in the pen. And effectively um, what happens then is that um, fish farming tends to contribute to the overfishing problem, right? Because you need feed in order um, to, to feed the fish. Uh, and industry is alert to this, I have to say. So thinking through a different register, um, a couple of, so two summers ago, uh, I was in Norway uh, and went to a salmon farm uh, where I heard the industry rep, uh, you know, again, very alert to the fact that people are aware that farmed fish contributes to the overfishing problem. And so to um, skirt, uh, that critique, industry thought it's a great idea to somehow now feed salmon a diet of 70% genetically modified soy. 
Uh, so salmon um, are carnivorous fish. They don't eat um, genetic, they don't eat soy, let alone genetically modified soy. Um, and so, you know, interestingly, you know, I will say too, a, a dear colleague of mine um, in Norway sent me this news item about uh, the fact that a bluefin uh, had gotten into a cage at one of these salmon farms. And when they went in, uh, when divers went in to extract the bluefin uh, and they did an autopsy on her stomach, they found that not one salmon was in the bluefin's belly, despite the fact that the bluefin had been in the cage with hundreds of docile salmon for a week. Right, so, um, you know, when I heard that, you know, it's, it's clear, you know, that, you know, the, the bluefin, I'm certain, I'm certain was able to tell um, that this was an utterly debased salmon. Another question. To... Go ahead, oh. Evan. Thanks. Yeah. So, so the book gestures to these much bigger processes that are underway. The this, the violent rifts in the savage political economy that are spreading across across the globe to produce marginalized and disposable beings of all kinds. And you know, uh, uh, you know, panning out a little bit from the bluefin to think about these bigger processes that the bluefin's entangled in. Um, and maybe piggybacking on that comment on um, regenerative efforts. I mean, what what are what are the scope and the scale of changes that are needed in this political and economic system that might start to either stitch together some of those rifts? Or, I mean, the 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 metaphor of healing is often overused. But but how do we you know hold the world back together in in the face of this violence that's um, really mind-boggling in scale. I mean, I think, um, you know, in some ways, part of a way to understand what happened at ICAT was not only to pay attention to what was present, but also to what was absent, right? So absent, uh, I mean, utterly absent were, um, you know, again, any sort of reverence for the animal. There was no, um, there, there is no, I mean, I, I'm non-existent. There is no attention whatsoever to incorporate an indigenous worldview. There is no a, attempt whatsoever to incorporate, um, you know, just other ways of imagining the, anim the animal beyond her commodity form. And um, in some ways, you know, I, I do think that, um, you know, if I, if I look on the, the current research project that um, I was describing earlier that uh, you know, some of these meetings that I've attended uh, at UN headquarters, part of what is so disturbing is the bluefin um, or the fish in general is not only a commodity. The bluefin has now or an other fish has become a genetically modified resource. Um, and so you can sort of see the way in which at the uh, high levels of um, you know, these supranational regulatory um, agencies are um, in the making of uh, treaty texts, the way in which there actually is a doubling down on extraction rather than a pulling away. Um, and you know, in some ways, uh, and, and part of really the, the responsibility that I feel as someone that's inside these spaces is just to inform the public about what is going on. Um, and I, I do think, um, you know, as, as, as fraught and as, um, uh, as the, the media campaigns were uh, to draw attention to what was going on with the bluefin, they nonetheless were really important because um, those media campaigns did put stress on uh, an institution like ICAT to pull back on harvest, even if momentarily. And so there is a sense too, I, you know, I'm hoping, you know, Evan, I, I, I don't have necessarily the, the solution, but I, 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 do, um, I do hope that um, as people become informed, they'll put pressure on their government to move us away from these extractive kinds of logics. I had a 
Can Go ahead, Ashley. Question. Um, you know, the, the question of um, uh, fisher folk and um, people's global dependence on fisheries is not something I've researched in a huge amount of detail. So I'd love to hear you comment on that. But, you know, from the little I know about it, my sense is that something like a billion people, you know, a really significant segment of uh, humanity is dependent on the oceans around them. And so I guess what I'm wondering about is the interconnection between the kind of large scale transnational fishing practices and sort of what might be called sustenance fishing by fisher folk. And, and I'm wondering if we might be able to think of a kind of intersectional climate insurgency happening because, you know, in the global south, as fisher folk aren't able to survive anymore um, because of ocean acidification and because of the oceans being fished out, they, they're forced to move to cities, right, where they're more and more dependent on fluctuating grain prices and other vagaries of international markets. Um, so, you know, I guess I wonder to what extent we could think about uprisings, uh, such as the ones we saw a decade ago, and, you know, some of the uprisings we've been seeing in the context of the pandemic over food prices being connected into this whole kind of global web of nature and humanity under crisis. Um, so, but thinking specifically about that connection between, you know, fisher folk and these kind of global um, industries that you track, Jennifer, I, I wonder if you've thought about those connections and can comment on them. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. And I, you know, as, as I alluded to briefly in the, in the comments, you know, part of the challenge here is that, you know, when I was at an ICAP meeting, I remember speaking to, um, uh, delegates from Ghana, from Senegal, and you know, so they don't have neither Ghana or Senegal, um, Uruguay, um, they don't have a quota to fish for bluefin, but yet bluefin just absolutely overtook um, really a lot of, I mean, sucked the air really, um, you know, the oxygen out of a lot of ICAT's work. And so there's a sense then that the global south is not well served by these institutions. And that shouldn't be surprising if these institutions serve the global commodities trade, right? And so, um, and so there's a sense then, um, you know, I, I, as, you, as you commented, you know, part of what is also, uh, you know, deeply, uh, you know, in some ways I tried to get at it, get at it in the book. And I, you know, it's, it's something that I think in general, the, the movement of marine conservation has been extraordinarily slow, if at all, to take on questions of environmental justice. It's a very white, it's a very privileged space of activism. And um, as a result, um, you know, so for example, there was one um, uh, interlocutor from the field when I asked questions about environmental justice, his comment to me was, right, and this is one of the, um, uh, this is a, a, one of the leading environmentalists working in marine conservation. His comment to me was, um, I don't work in poverty reduction. And I think that's a, actually a really important point, right? Because you can sort of see the way in which um, these streams, right? And, and uh, you know, some of the marine conservation groups these are, you know, the Pew Environment Group, which is Sunoco money, is a very powerful, uh, very powerful group. Um, and it's not to say that they're not interested in what is happening amongst artisanal fishers, but the linkages, um, I'm, not, I'm not seeing, at least on a global scale, um, as, much as, I, uh, as much as I would like. And I think some of the reason for that Again, I think is because the marine conservation movement in general has been very slow to take on matters of environmental justice. So thanks, Jen. I mean, your answer there reminded me of a guest lecture you gave in my sustainability class where you said, follow the money. You know, you'll find out a lot about environmental marine justice by doing that. Um, so, so many comments and questions. Let me... Uh, follow up on a few with you. 
Anonymous attendee says, though I'm a big fan of the show Wicked Tuna, I'm afraid this magnificent animal will no longer be around. Yeah. Carl Zimmer, I, yeah, go I, ahead. I, I mean, I, um, I, I understand, um, you know, it's, it's the kind of double-edged sword, right? So it's, um, it's great that people are even aware that the bluefin exists. Right, so imagine you're, you know, which is, you know, the, the bluefin is the most iconic of all tunas. So this is not a, you know, so there's no, there's no show about catching yellowfin. There's no show about catching albacore. There's no show about catching a lowly skipjack, right? And so in some ways, um, the show sort of reproduces the hierarchy of being actually within the broader space um, of fisheries. And so in some ways, you know, I feel my, myself conflicted, which is, is probably just representative of the larger paradox, which is um, it's great that at least the show is available. So people are aware of the bluefin, but what happens on that show is, you know, um, reproduces the predator prey relationship as if, uh, you know, the, um, you know, the, the angler is um, in a, a space uh, to just extract the animal. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I understand the sentiment, um, but I, I wish there was a show instead. Um, you know, if I'm thinking of, you know, what models might we have, um, I've like particularly drawn, um, for those of you that haven't seen my octopus teacher, it's an extraordinary film um, where you see, uh, you see an octopus living, uh, her, you see, so you see the life cycle of an octopus in ways that, um, are social, that engage with, um, a diver, uh, off the coast of, um, you know, South Africa. So, you know, there's a, a sense of, um, creating a personality, creating an individual, um, in order to be able to better identify and empathize with this marginalized creature. And that, that is not at all possible in a, um, in a TV show filled with commercials um, such as Wicked Tuna. Great, so from our own Carl Zimring, who is a, a prolific writer on questions of sustainability and waste. I'm delighted this e event is happening and congratulations. Uh, Jen, how, if at all, have global events since the book was published affected your perspective of the present and the future of global governance? Thank you for that, Carl. Um, I'd say two things. Um, so one um, would be kind of, you know, in many ways echoing what um, Ashley and others had mentioned, which is, you know, the fact that we're all here virtually um, as a result of a pandemic caused by a, a disease agent moving from animal to people as a result of deforestation, uh, if anything, just recommits me uh, to, a multi-species space um, and, uh, and to sort of to show the extraordinary importance of the relationship, not just between um, people and animal, but people and plant. Um, you know, I, I read um, since the book came out, um, Richard Power's Overstory, the Overstory, and there's a, you know, the, even the opening chapter to have us think about just the loss of a chestnut tree, you know, a chestnut tree. Um, and so, uh, you know, and, and I think in many ways, the, the other, you know, really important, um, the, the place that I'm increasingly starting um, to commit myself to is in, in many ways kind of piggybacks on the previous comment about my octopus teacher, which is, you know, so how do we create an environment where we can really appreciate and revere these creatures? And I think there's a, um, you know, so, there's a, a sense in which, you know, unlike the octopus, unlike the whale, something like a, a, a bluefin, we actually, we have no idea what her social life is like. 
there's never, we've never seen a bluefin from, from baby to adult. We have no, there, so, and as a result, I think that inhibits us from being able to identify, not necessarily anthropomorphize, but just be able to identify with what their life world is like. And therefore what we are losing by no longer um, caring for them. And so, um, you know, I, I think in, in many ways I've kind of come to a, a place where uh, I would really, I, you know, I would love to, I don't know, maybe this is the next book, I don't know, but, you know, I would love to be able to write uh, about the life world of just one tuna and what that might do to be able to encourage people to better identify um, with this extraordinary stress they're under. Great, and I know we have many more comments and, and questions than we have time for. I wanted to bring forward a, a long comment and question that I think is also very pertinent uh, for your discussion on this. Tanya King says, my experience with the Australian Fisheries Management Authority somewhat mirrors what I've heard today. Hanging out in those meetings with a bad coffee and sandwiches wheeled in periodically by devalued translucent weight staff. Certainly I recognize the bioeconomic modeling which is used to justify the business as usual management of species as if they were literal money or paper fish. I'm struck by your comments about the conflicted experience of the ICAT in my experience, the majority of those I encountered were so enamored, so captivated by the narrative of the techno fix, the bioeconomic solutions being pro-offered, pro which are, I absolutely agree, are money-making tools, and the wisdom of the tragedy of the common story that they see themselves as eco-warriors. Can you comment, Jen, on your experiences in ICAT? So thank you for that very complex rendering, Tanya. Yeah, that's a fantastic comment. Um, fantastic. I mean, and I think uh, I mean, without a shadow of a doubt, the belief in the techno fix is alive and well inside these regulatory zones. And in many ways, um, that has to be the case because it's precisely, right? So if you create a problem or if you see a problem and, and you know that there's a solution that also um, opens the space, not only for the techno fix, but also the possibility for these institutions to continue on into perpetuity as they are currently organized, right? And so there's this sense in which, um, absolutely, I, I um, you know, and maybe it, it, it came out in the book, I, I, I don't know, but there was a couple of moments that when I was in the field, um, it was really overwhelming um, as an observer to see, I mean, it was like a, almost like a religiosity um, of, of faith that somehow the techno fix was going to work. Um, and so, uh, you know, so I, I completely uh, appreciate that comment. Um, and uh, I mean, I guess to the um, other, uh, you know, part that I would, um, I would mention is just in, in general, um, uh, you know, there's a, you know, at an ICAP meeting, um, similar to some of the UN meetings I attended. So this is, you know, 500 people um, you know, so they, the, so there's no one uh, mode of um, what it meant to be an ICAT delegate. And I think, you know, the other important piece that we haven't brought yet to the table is the recognition that what is also happening here is they're coming in their capacity as citizens, oftentimes representing a nation state. And so part of the complexity of the problem is that um, when you have a global environmental problem, a planetary problem that is being addressed through an architecture that is based in the nation state, where each delegation is coming to the table worried about their little corner of the world, it becomes really difficult inside these spaces to generate an adequate response, right? So you can sort of see the way in which it's not just empires, nationalism is very present inside these zones. 
And, um, and again, you can kind of see the way that the very architecture for environmental governance is not structured in a way that can adequately address what's going on, right? So we saw this, you know, this is one way to understand what happened with the Paris Climate Agreement uh, and why the Paris Climate Agreement became diluted in ways that um, were not as robust as many people would have wanted it to be. Because again, um, each nation state is worried about its own corner. And that's not a very good way of caring for the planet. Time went very quickly during this panel and we're at the conclusion. I think that's a really great place to end. And I thank all of you for joining us. And I really wanna thank Nayanika as well who had to log off early because it's 2.30 in the morning in India. So that's really a kind of solidarity to come in at 2.30 in the morning. So thank you again, Jen, for this wonderful book. Thank you, Heather. And I don't know, Heather, if you wanted to close us out. Yeah, thank you so much, everybody, for attending those, this wonderful event this afternoon. It was really, really great to be celebrating this book. And um, of course, thank you so much to our author, Jen. Thank you to our moderator. Thank you to our wonderful discussants for such an engaging discussion this afternoon. And just a reminder that the discount code for purchasing a copy of Red Gold at the University of Minnesota Press website is in the chat and that a recording of this event will be sent to all registrants and it will be posted on the University of Minnesota Press YouTube channel very soon. So thank you all again and have a wonderful evening, morning. Thank you all. Yeah, no, I just like very briefly, just um, just to say thank you to Malka um, for moderating, uh, University of Minnesota Press, Nyanika, Ashley, Evan, and everyone that joined. It really, um, really, it's a, it's, you know, the great that it's only the, the work of one person um, and it, it never is. So thank you all for coming. Thank you everybody, good night.